newness in you. And so, God, I pray that we would walk faithfully in the newness of life you've called us to. Jesus, thank you. Amen. We are in Ecclesiastes. We will be in Ecclesiastes 5. Uh, there should be a Bible maybe around you or in front of you. It will also be on the screen, Lord willing. Uh, I want to... I want to share with you this morning about the meaning of life. The meaning of life. You see, we've been in Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes, if anything, it's how to live your life without God. And it's, it's all the vanity and the emptiness of if God didn't exist, where would you go? Where would you turn? What would you do? How would you think? How would you value life? So if you were going to look up, don't do this right now. If you're just going to Google what's the meaning of life, at least on my computer, the algorithm hit a, an article from about two years ago in the Atlantic. And it, it comes up, the meaning of life is surprisingly simple. Okay, sounds good enough. And then it, it lists out things that you find meaning in life. Uh, it talks about how you eat. It talks about psychology and philosophy. It talks about looking for purpose and significance. But then, at the very end of the article, I want to read this for you. It says, All of this advice relies on one very strong assumption, that life actually has meaning. That is an Ecclesiastes statement, if ever I heard one. Not everyone agrees with this. Some have built entire schools of thought on the assumption that life is inherently meaningless, Ecclesiastes, and that we can be truly free only if, only when we embrace this truth, right? Is that we would have freedom if we would say it's all meaningless. Just sounds great, doesn't it? First article in Google. <laughs> if we believe in nothing, if nothing has any meaning, and if we can affirm no values whatsoever, then everything is possible, and nothing has any importance. Just a great way to live your life. It, and, and last little bit, each of us has to decide whether we believe this is true. I cannot say for certain. It is, as we say in my business, an untestable hypothesis the paradox of the untestable hypothesis is that even if we seek, we can never be sure that we have found what is real and true. You live your whole life to say, is this real and true? Only to die and say, is this real and true? Only to go in the circle of, there's really nothing to this life. And then it says, but one thing is certain. We will not find anything unless we look. That sounds like a great way to live your life, doesn't it? But that's exactly what I'm hoping that we see and draw out in the midst of Ecclesiastes. This, this individual is just writing an extra chapter in Ecclesiastes. He's saying, I mean, is there really anything in this life? Is there anything worth living for? It's nothing. It's empty. It's pointless. It's meaningless and we might look for it and still not even know that it's true but we at least should just spend our life looking the author in Ecclesiastes is asking these questions in the passage we're going to look at Ecclesiastes 5 verse 18 says this behold I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, for this is the gift of God. He sees something good here. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. There's something good, but then it takes a shift. You see, God has given this man something and he enjoys it, but then it takes a different tone here. It says in verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, 
There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them. You see, the first man, he had power to enjoy these things. This man has no power to enjoy them. But he says, he is a, but a stranger will enjoy them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, he also has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over. Right? I have a good life. I've got possessions. I've got wealth. I have a hundred children. I have years beyond measure. Yet enjoy no good do all go to one place? Question. So he's starting to ask these questions now. What's the point of all this if somebody should have all these things but not enjoy them? And then he starts thinking, well, th about life. Now he's thinking about the afterlife. Do all go to one place? Right? Everybody's going go to gonna die. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. He's going to ask another question here. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. Whatever has, whatever has come to be has already been named. And it is known what man is and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? Right? Who, who has all the answers? He's asking, who knows all this stuff? Who can put it all together? Somebody's got to be, be, be able to answer these questions for me. Is there somebody stronger? It can't just be who has the most words. For he knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And so here he is. He's asking really big questions. Right? What, is, what does your life amount to? What is good for man? What, what comes after this? And, and, and he's asking questions like, what is the advantage of wise living in verse 8? What is the advantage of all the words in verse 11? And where do we find a stronger answer in verse 10? How do you share the gospel with people? I'm going to pivot for just a second. When you want to tell somebody about Jesus, you probably say, hey, do you know you're a sinner and you need Jesus? You may go through... Uh, rules for living. You may go through the commands of Christ. You may go through Roman road. But have you ever stopped and just asked somebody and said, what do you live for in this life? What wakes you up in the morning? Does your life have meaning and purpose? It's thoughtful. And, and, and I need to be honest, not everybody asks these questions in life the exact same way. I think most people are truly asking, what's going to make me happy today? What's going to make me happy over the course of my life? And then from there, they build their life out on that trajectory. But the questions he's asking here are essential. At some point or another, somebody's going to ask, what is the point or meaning of this? How do I make sense of this world? You see, we have very much a verse 11 a uh, uh, verse 10, as we look at this, that the more words, 
sometimes it just becomes more meaningless. Because there's people on TV, there's people on your phone who will gladly tell you over and over and over again that this is where you need to be giving your time, your attention, your money. This is what's going to make you feel important and loved and valued. But when the words abound, what does he say? It's more vanity. And so what are these life's questions? The questions are, verse 12, for who knows what is good for man? Who knows? Right? Lots of people are going to give you a lot of different answers on what's good for your life. And then that next question, it didn't really underline very well. It says, for who can tell man what will be after him? What comes after this life? What comes after you? What, what, what does the future hold? Right? What is good for man and what comes after this? And then all these other questions that are going to be asked in this passage really sum up into those two different things. And so what does he look at? He looks at two individuals. He looks at two individuals. In, in the tail end of chapter 5, we see one individual who has really good things, and we see another individual, starting in verse 1, he has good things, but there's a dividing line between the two of them. It says they're both given good things by God. But the first has the power to enjoy them, and the second does not have the power to enjoy them. Right, And that, that power is given by God. It's in verse 2, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. One of these men is content, and the other is never satisfied. And so we see the evil that is, befalls this man in verses 1 through 8. I, I need you to understand, this man here is described as the Old Testament picture of he's got it going on. You may not think that, because to have a hundred children may not be on your list of priorities. But let, let, me, let me recap this. If a man, verse 3, if a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, right? He has a big family and a long life. Oh, that's to go on top of verse 2. He has wealth, possessions, and honor. He's got everything. He is the picture of fullness and prosperity to the original audience here. And we need to see that the same way to understand this. He's got it going on. Everybody wants to be like Bill. Oh, man. If I could just be like, yet yeah, what's it saying? Bill's going, man, I just can't figure life out. Is there more to this? What do I need to be doing with my life? Where do I need to spend my time? Where, how do I need to spend my money? I have this family. What's going to happen after I die? He just has questions. And so everybody would say he is blessed except for him. Everybody at glance says, oh, this is a blessed man. But he wasn't. But there's a good man in this. Verses 18 through 20 of chapter 5. Behold, I've seen what is good and fitting. He talks about this man who works. But the thing that sets him apart, it says he was gifted all this by God. He has a job. He has wealth in verse 19. He has possessions. And it says he has power to enjoy them. So one has goods, the other has the best of goods, the biggest of families, the longest of life, but he has no power to enjoy them. We need to understand and explore where does the power come from to enjoy life? Where does the power come from to find meaning in life? What is good for man? What will be after man? So we see the evil, we see the good, and we need to understand in this passage, it says, I have seen what is good and fitting. It's to find enjoyment in your work. There's truth in that. There is absolutely truth in that. I, I hope you've experienced the joy of a hard day's work. And if you have children, I hope your children discover it soon. <laughs> 
If you have 100 children, I hope they discover it today. <laughs> There's something good in that. But it's not the ultimate thing. It's not the ultimate thing. You see, even work is seen as given by God in this. Everything is seen in its right way as a gift from Him. So there's evil, there's good, but then there's something better in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. You see, the wandering of the appetite is where we live. It's a world without God. It's a world full of questions, but no answers. Or the answers are sad, like this Atlantic article. Is, is this the best we can do? The brightest minds, the, the people who have published a book called How to Build a Happy Life. Is this the best we can do? But that's exactly it. There's a life searching. We see it here. There's somebody who is better as the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. It's the wandering of maybe this will make me happy. Maybe this will fill me up. Maybe this will finally get me where I want to go. We live in a fascinating time. I was, I was asking as I watched a helicopter fly over, like, you know, we know that the Wright brothers, you know, they're, they're credited with flight. And I'm going, who invented the helicopter? And how did that go? We're so far beyond helicopter. We're going to Mars, man. What a time to be alive. Like, we, we are living out science fiction books. We're sending up telescopes and probes and rovers that go deeper and deeper so that we can understand, quote, the universe. But yet somehow, every day that goes by, we learn less. Think about this for a second. Ecclesiastes is life without God. It's life as the secular man. It's life with the highest values of this world, but without God. That's Ecclesiastes. That's, that's what Solomon is living out his life. And then every once in a while, he comes up for air, and he remembers, oh yeah, God does that. God is good. And that's how he finishes. But in the midst of his journey, he looks very much like a normal person in 2023 America. So think about all the good things in this life. Sunrises, sunsets, rain falling on a metal roof, come on, ice cream, like really good ice cream. When I was a, when I was a kid, I played hockey in an adult hockey league, and the guy I played, his name was Al, and Al and I were going up to our hockey game, he was over the age of 40, and I'm just a punk kid in my teens who skated circles around all the big guys. And Al said, Tim, do you like ice cream? I said, oh yeah, I like ice cream. He said, well, let me tell you, when you get older, there's something called a caloric intake. And one of these days, it's going to catch up with you as it's caught up with me. Al was not a skinny man. But he was pretty nimble on skates, and he patted his belly. I now, as I have a birthday tomorrow, understand what Al was talking about. Sorry, side note. Ice cream, like sunsets and sunrises and rain and ice cream and cultural cuisines, man. Have you, have you had cultural cuisine where, where every bite you take is just a flavor explosion? And you just think, man, it, the next bite can't be as good as the last. And you go, oh my goodness, it is. And maybe it's just your favorite Mexican food place. Maybe it's some very unique Greek food place, or I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just good old American food, and it's just a bacon cheeseburger on the 4th of July. Maybe the good things in life, you, you think, oh, that's none of those things. It's the relationships. It's giving love and experiencing love, right? Those are the good things, man. When I, I, it's like my soul connects in that moment, and life is so good and rich and full. You got those good things in your mind? One of those good things? Let me explain the good things of this world the way Ecclesiastes would do 
in 2023. All those good things are just chemical. That sunrise that you thought was beautiful, it's just chemicals patterned in the exact right way. You found it romantic, but it's really nothing. Those, those taste buds, they're just chemicals. There's just chemicals coming across your tongue the way it evolved into. There's really nothing to it. Oh, and those relationships that you're experiencing that you think are so full of love and richness and meaning, there's no meaning to those. It's just chemicals. Have you heard of pheromones? The sad thing is I'm, I'm not joking. In a godless world, you can't explain romance. You can't explain love. You can't find meaning the way God intended it. I, I laugh whenever I see Neil Tyson DeGrasse, whenever he posts all these pictures of the telescope, of, of what's coming up, the James Webb telescope, because Jay, he doesn't believe in intelligent design. But yet he looks into the stars and he goes, isn't this incredible? I go, it's just a big accident. Who cares? That's what you believe, buddy. I wouldn't say buddy. That's not the nicest way of saying it. But that's what he believes. And that's what this world believes. You remove God from the picture, it's just chemicals, and it's all an accident. Your life is not on a course with design. It, there is no purpose to life. You can search and search and search. Eh, you may find some good answers, but you probably won't. Man, it's so encouraging. It's so good. So you go, anything more than all these things is wishful dreaming at best. And so you just say, oh, it's just chemicals. My chemicals connected with your chemicals. I love you, whatever that means. No. Isn't that just a grand way to live your life? It's drab and it's meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. It's, it's vanity. It's empty. It's chasing after the wind. And so when we're looking for answers, when we're searching, we don't just go, I'm just going to look on the bright side of everything. Other people, as you are supposed to look for meaning in life, if you should look for meaning in life, as they say, you should look inside yourself. And as you look inside yourself, you're going to find things. Well, which version of yourself? There was my young punk teenage version or my aging don't eat so much ice cream version. Which one of those should I look inside of? No. You should look and wander outside. Literally just go wandering. And as you wander through life, you may stumble onto your purpose. You may, you may get there eventually. Eventually. This is Ecclesiastes. How do we find this in a world devoid and lacking of meaning? There's God's answer. right? God has an answer. There's the wandering of appetite, which is never... Do you, do you see that? In all of the themes of Ecclesiastes, there's this other theme other than vanity and emptiness. It's the theme of never satisfied. Never satisfied. It's never good enough. There's never enough. I always need more. There's God's answer. Verse 9. It's not the wandering of the appetite. It's the sight of the eyes. And that God has an answer. God has answers to the big questions we are asking. If we will see it. If we will see it. Because if we look at Romans 1, it's not that God is not plainly seen. No, it's that God is clearly denied. It's that the truth about God is suppressed. It's pushed down. It's tried to be removed in every way. Yet the more you try to remove God, what happens? The more empty the world seems. It's almost like those two things need to go together somehow. And so what happens is the wise see, right? Because he interjects some wisdom every once in a while. And the wise see God. How do they see God? 
the wise see God in everything. The wise see God in the hospital room. The wise see God at the ice cream parlor. The wise see God in the sunrise and the sunset. The wise see God in their work, their toil. And sometimes that's really hard. The wise see God in changing diapers and cleaning vomit. The wise see God in meeting as the people of God. The wise see God in everything rather than wandering from one thing to the next. Because this wandering of the appetite is exactly what the world teaches. You keep searching until you find something you land on, and when you land on something, you just go full steam ahead. Well, what if it's art, and you just are so filled up, and you find meaning in your art? What happens when you lose your eyesight, and art flees from you? Or maybe... You're a vocalist, and what happens when you lose your voice? And, and this is what happens. We see this throughout the news cycles. There's an athlete who's at the top of their world, and then one day they get an injury. And they ask, why do I even live my life anymore? This is, there's not just one article like that. There's hundreds of them. The recording artist. One day they woke up and they realized, I, my voice isn't the same as it used to be. Well, like, what do I make of this? You see, when we take this world and we find our meaning in this world, it's, there's, there's good things in that, but it can be taken from you at any moment. And that even comes down to your family, your loved ones. So there's a warning in Ecclesiastes in this. But no, when we see God in everything, the answers in life become clear. We see what God has given you. Do you have anything? God has given that to me. Right? The, the, the good things here is that he sees it as God has given wealth and possessions and power. This, this work, it's a gift from God. The man with a hundred children, it's a gift from God. But not everybody sees it that way. Not everybody sees their life, whatever they have, as a gift from the Almighty. And so we would be encouraged to do exactly in verse 18. Behold, I've seen what is good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. Enjoy what God has given you. As God designed it. You see, when we pervert truth, when we make things be what they're not, when we do it our way instead of God's way, we take the gift, we manipulate it, we make it something other than, and we completely rob it of its meaning. We completely will suck every bit of joy out of it. And so if we go through life and we find a deficiency somewhere, it's not God's fault. There is no deficiency in God. There is not something you're going to come across in life and you're going to say, well, he can't help with that. He doesn't know. And so this is how we can accept whatever lot we have in life. Do you have health? Praise God. Are you ailing in some way? Is there, is there sickness and hurt? Don't tell me to praise God, Pastor. You have your life. I'm not telling you to praise God for whatever disease, cancer, ailment, pain. No, you're, you're looking at God and you're seeing this has come through the fingers of God. I can still praise Him. Will I accept only what is good and not what is hard and bad in this world? There's not a deficiency in God in this. We can accept this lot. We can rejoice 
the power to enjoy this life is a gift from God. Whether it be wealth, possessions, honor, all the good things, God's way, instead of doing it your way, your time, your place, however you want, is the power to enjoy it. Because this world wants to take the good things and they want to make it everything. They want to make it everything. Last week it was money. We've looked at pleasure and possessions in Ecclesiastes. The world wants to take it, your heart wants to take those good things and say, I just need more of that until it becomes everything and it pushes God completely out of your life. And you say, well, I don't need God. I don't need God telling me what to do. I don't need God telling me how to live. Is that how you're going to find joy? Is that how you're going to find meaning and fulfillment? How's it working out? Is it going well? Do you need me to find you some case studies of other people that have tried living their life that way? In Scripture, we, we have the ultimate case study. Because not only do we see that there's a designer, a creator, but he loves you and he's, he's working on your behalf. And so what do we do? We reframe your life, all of your life, under God. And what happens when you do that, when you find true wisdom, everything finally comes alive. And I mean everything. There are some of you in here, you taste God in your banana split. You taste God in a home-cooked meal. You see the hand of Almighty God when you watch the sun come up. Or maybe it's when you see the sun set. And so all of a sudden, those things take on a fuller, more beautiful, grander meaning. You're awakened to the glory. You're awakened to the Creator that you and I were made to love. We were made to love God. We were made to love other people. And so when we reframe that under the right, sovereign love of God, there's fullness of joy. There's a true, full life. Is that you've been gifted. And so you're not just chance chemicals. You're designed, you're deliberate, and you can delight in God. And so we don't find the greater things through naiv naivety, through wishes, but in real, hard, long thinking. So whatever you're, you're going through in life, as you want to frame it out and you want to say, what is good for me? What comes after me? You don't just say, well, I hope it's something nice. I hope I'm on the right path. Maybe you're walking through a very hard season. You would benefit not from thinking less in this season, but actually from thinking more. And what I find so often, over and over and over again, as we look at the, the sight of the eyes, when our sight is properly fixed, and we get 20-20 with God, all of a sudden, instead of seeing all the hard, we see, man, I see how God has been working this out. Do you see how God brought this in at this time and not at that time? Do you see how God has been preparing the way? Do you see how God put this doctor, do you see how God put this person in traffic during this accident? Do you see this? Do you see this? So it's not thinking less, it's thinking more. And the more you think about it, the more you frame it under God's goodness, things don't get less meaning, they get more meaning. The flavor doesn't turn stale, the flavor turns rich. Because you see a designer that you were designed to delight in. 
and that the delights of this world are just not good enough. We see what God did, we see what God made, we see what God planned, and we see how God loves. And so what is good for man? Right, the two big questions here. What is good for man? And what comes after this are wrapped up in one answer. And we see it in Jesus. When things were good and when, when things were hard, what did Jesus do? He framed it by the Father. He had a better sight. He has the, the sight that you and I lack and you and I need. And so what is Jesus doing? He is truly answering the question, what is good for us? Not to press yourself a little bit into God, no, to go full in. Right? We who say we should do everything in moderation, not with God. It's either all or nothing with Jesus. There is no holding back. Because in the person of Christ, we finally have the better sight that our wandering hearts have been looking for. Have you been looking for love? Do you have the sight that has seen Jesus yet? Are you looking for significance? You say, well, you know, I have a job, and I like my job, and I feel good at the end of the day, but is there something more? Have you considered Jesus? Who puts a significance on you that you, if you're in Christ, are a child of God? And whether you farm or you run a pharmacy, you now do it for the Lord Jesus? Have you considered him? Do you have the better sight to see that? You a parent? And that's your, your chief aim, your, your main purpose in life. Jesus loves those kids more than you love them. He's given you instruction to give them instruction. And he's put you as the authority in their life, whether they like it or not. Jesus, what is good for man? What comes after this? Come on, you know Jesus answers that question too. And you think, we're sinners. Why did Jesus have to die? He, he died because we could never save ourselves. He died because he loves us. And he wants us in relationship with him, not just in eternity, but right now. And our sin skews our vision. Our sin separates us from God our sin hurts every relationship, even the relationship, if we were the only person, it hurts our thinking. It hurts our work. Jesus flips it all right side up in every way. And, and here's the thing. We can say, oh yeah, I, I agree with that, right? Life's big questions are answered in God. But we need to be honest, we derail from that a lot. When we get angry, when something's not going my way, which is like every day, when there's some unexpected event that happens in my life, or when we reach the pinnacle. Solomon reached the pinnacle. He was the greatest king of the known world at the time. The richest man you could ever want to be. He might have fathered a hundred children. He had it all. And he stepped back and he said, is there more than this? And he's looking at people who have less than him saying, that looks pretty good. I mean, God gave me this, and God gave them this. What, what am I missing? You're missing Jesus. And we can say, again, we agree with this, but I guarantee you, you're going to leave here, you're going to wake up tomorrow, and you're going to be on a search. What's going to make me happy today? 
What's going to give me the meaning I'm looking for? What's going to give me the security? What's going to give me the significance? What's going to make me truly happy? And you're going to search for it on your phone. You're going to search for it on your TV. You're going to search for it in your time. You're going to search for it in how you spend your money. And Jesus is going to sit and say, come on, there's a better sight. There's a better way to see this. Don't do what the world says. And so what's it going to be? Right? Are you going to frame your life out under the meaning and purpose God has given to you? And to, to all of us, we exist for God. And the more we try to remove God, the more questions we have. And because you exist for God, you can ask God hard questions. He's not scared of your questions. And you can think really hard about God in the midst of good, in the midst of bad. And so that's what we get to do when we open up Scripture. But listen, if you're here, and you've never given your life to Christ, you, you don't have the testimony that Robert and Jessica have and say, is it your testimony that you've trusted in Jesus to be your Lord, your boss, your Savior, the one who saves you and forgives you of your sin? Then that means you're still searching in the biggest of ways. And you can't answer the question, not just what is good for man, but what comes after this. Jesus knows. Right? What, what comes after this is either eternity with God or all of eternity away from God. And so how you answer that question today is an eternity-based question. So I would encourage you here in a moment, if you need to settle these questions, to come down, visit with myself. Marla will be down front. We would love to help you understand. Or if you just have some questions and you need prayer, we would love to do that as well. Let me, I'm going to ask our, our two musicians today to come up and lead us in a time of response. And that's what this is. It, it's a time to respond. And however God is working in your heart, and I have no doubt that he is.